Hello, welcome to the Topic 3.1 Class Notes, Thermal Concepts. Recall that we can think of matter as consisting of small masses. In the case of solids, the masses, we can imagine them being connected with tiny springs. The springs represent the intermolecular forces. Today we want to discuss three physical quantities that are sometimes confused with one another. Those quantities are temperature, internal energy, and heat. Let's consider each of these three quantities. Temperature. We all have an idea of what temperature is, although we might not be able to define temperature clearly. One place to start is by defining temperature as a measure of the hotness or coldness of an object. But why is this useful? Well, it turns out that when objects are in contact with each other, energy will spontaneously move or flow from the hotter object to the cooler object. When the heat stops flowing, we say that the objects are now in thermal equilibrium. That is to say, they are now at the same temperature. But what does temperature tell us about an object on the molecular level? As it turns out, temperature is a property that is directly proportional to the average molecular kinetic energy of an object. It's not a measure of the energy. If it were, we would measure temperature in joules. It's just directly proportional to the average kinetic energy of the object. Measuring temperature. It turns out that it's not possible to directly measure the temperature of an object. So what can we do? If we can find a property of an object or substance that varies directly with temperature, then we can measure that. Fortunately, there are a number of such properties. Some of them are the volume of a gas or liquid, the length of a solid, electrical resistance, or the density of an object. All of these vary directly with the temperature of an object. Once we find a property that is directly proportional to temperature, we can build a thermometer by using easily reproducible temperatures such as the freezing point and boiling point of water to mark these two temperatures on our thermometer. Since we have hopefully chosen a property that's directly proportional, we can then interpolate between these two points to mark a scale on our thermometer. This process is called calibrating the thermometer. Kelvin versus Celsius. There are several temperature scales, but only two of them are used in making scientific measurements. Kelvins are an absolute temperature scale. This means that zero kelvins means no molecular kinetic energy, something called absolute zero. In most scientific equations, it's important to measure temperature in kelvins. Celsius is a relative temperature scale. Since we define zero degrees Celsius to be the freezing point of water, and since the freezing point of water is 273 kelvins, in order to convert from Celsius to kelvins, we will add 273 to the Celsius reading. Our next quantity is internal energy. Imagine a solid as a collection of jiggling masses connected together by springs. The moving masses have kinetic energy, and the stretching springs have elastic potential energy. So the internal energy of an object is the sum of all the individual kinetic energies of all the molecules, plus the sum of all the elastic potential energy of all the intermolecular forces. If you think of our mass and spring molecular model that we're looking at, internal energy would be represented by the sum of all the kinetic energies of all the jiggling masses, plus the sum of all the elastic potential energies of all of those springs. The internal energy of an object can be changed in two ways. If we add heat to the object, say by placing it in a flame, the heat added causes the molecules to jiggle faster, increasing the internal energy and the temperature. If we remove heat, say by placing our object in contact with a colder object, energy will flow out of the warmer object, causing the molecules to jiggle more slowly, and thus reducing the internal energy and the temperature of the object. If we do work on an object, say by rubbing it, or bending it, or in the case of the gas, compressing it, that will cause the molecules to move faster 
and thus increase the internal energy of the object. If a gas expands doing work, then the internal energy of the gas will decrease. Heat. Heat is energy that's being transferred from one body to another as a result of a difference in temperature. There are three ways to transfer heat from one body to another. Heat can be transferred by conduction, convection, or by radiation. Heat is different from internal energy. Heat is a measure of the energy that's moving from one object to another. Heat is not possessed by an object. Heat only exists when it's being transferred from one object to another. Specific heat capacity. When an object is heated, its temperature will go up. But not all materials respond in the same way when they're heated. If you place an empty metal pan over a stove burner, its temperature will increase rapidly. But if the pan is full of water, it may take many minutes for the water to reach its boiling point. What's going on here? As it turns out, there are three factors that affect how much the temperature of an object will change when heat is added to the object. First is the mass. More massive objects take more energy to warm up. For example, a tea kettle with a small quantity of water will come to a boil much more quickly than a tea kettle that's filled with water. The specific heat capacity, C, is a quantity that acknowledges that substances differ in how easily their temperatures are changed. Water is difficult to warm up, while it takes less energy to increase the temperature of an equal mass of iron. Specific heat is the number of joules of heat that it takes to raise the temperature of one kilogram of a substance by one Kelvin, or one degree Celsius. So let's review the variables in this equation. M is the mass in kilograms of the substance being heated. C is the specific heat capacity of the substance. It's the number of joules that it takes to heat one kilogram of the substance by one Kelvin. Delta T is the amount by which the temperature of the substance changes, measured in Kelvins or degrees Celsius. And Q is our symbol for the number of joules of heat added or removed from the substance. If Q is negative, then heat is being removed and the substance will cool. Phase change. If we take an ice cube from the freezer and heat it until it boils away into steam, we get a very interesting graph. Let's take a look at this graph. On the y-axis you see we have temperature. On the x-axis we have the no amount of heat that's been added to the ice cube. When we first take the ice cube out of the freezer, it's considerably colder than the freezing point of water. So as we start to add heat, you'll notice that the temperature increases, as we would expect. But then something sort of surprising happens. As the ice cube begins to melt into water, we're continuing to heat it, we're continuing to add energy to the cube. It's still over a burner. But the temperature stops rising. If you look at this section of the graph here, it plateaus. And what's happening is the bonds are being broken, converting the solid ice into liquid water. That takes energy, and all of the energy is being used to break the bonds, and the temperature doesn't go up. We get a plateau here. That's kind of interesting. Once the ice is all melted, and now we have liquid water in our container, the temperature of the water goes up as we continue to heat it, sort of like you'd expect. Then another interesting thing happens. As the water begins to boil and is converting into steam, the temperature stops rising. We continue to put heat in as our water boils and boils and boils, but the temperature stays the same until all of the water is boiled away. Now at this point, if we're boiling our ice cube in a pan, uh, we can't go any further. But if you look at section E on the graph, if somehow we could capture that steam and continue to add heat to it, then the, the gas would get hotter and hotter. So we have this five-part graph with an initial slope for the ice heating, a plateau at two here, uh, where the uh, ice is being converted into water. And then we have another slope here at three, where the liquid water is being heated. And then we have another plateau here at four, where the liquid water is boiling, but the temperature is not going up, 
And then finally, again, only if we could capture the steam somehow, we would have another slope as the steam is heated. We have two more equations, and those two equations deal with the conversion of the solid ice into water and the conversion of the liquid water into steam. The number of joules of heat that it takes to melt one kilogram of the ice is called the latent heat of fusion. The symbol here is L with a subscripted F. It's measured in joules per kilogram. So we have this equation Q equals MLF. Q is the amount of heat added to the ice cube, M is the mass of the ice cube, and L is this thing called the latent heat of fusion, which again is the number of joules of energy it's going to take to convert one kilogram of a substance from solid to liquid. Our next equation happens up here on this upper plateau. We have something called the latent heat of vaporization. The latent heat of vaporization is the number of joules of heat that it takes to convert one kilogram of a liquid into one kilogram of a vapor. In other words, it's the number of joules it takes to boil away a kilogram of the substance. So if we look at the whole equation here, the number of joules of energy that we add to the liquid is going to be equal to the mass of the liquid in kilograms multiplied by the latent heat of vaporization of the liquid measured in joules per kilogram. Okay, that's it for this time. If you have any questions, ask a question in class or on Edmodo. Take care.